My name is Henoch Ellert. I was born in Neustadt, Lithuania. When I was three or four years old, we moved to Heidekrug, where we opened a butchery and a polony factory. We sold a lot of kosher polonies to Germany. I went to primary school in German school, afterwards to Lithuanian high school. My bar mitzvah was in Heidekrug. There were about 30 Jewish families in Heidekrug. And all Jews left Heidekrug as it went back to Germany. We moved back to Neustadt in 1938 and opened the butchery and factory in Neustadt. In 1939, I left for Kovne, where I started to learn at Ort as an electrician. In 1940, the Russians occupied Lithuania. I was out for two years and in 41 back, went back to Neustadt for a holiday. On 22nd of June 1941, at five o'clock in the morning, the Germans marched into Neustadt. My dad, Michael, was arrested the same day and sent back to Heidegruck to work in a park. I was taken by the Germans to bury four German soldiers that were killed by the Russians. The German commandant of Neustadt was the baker of Heidekrog, from whom we used to buy bread for about 15 years. His name was Mr. Schade. When I returned from buy, buying the soldiers, when I returned from burying the soldiers, I saw other Jews burning the Dorim and Sivre Teures in the schoolyard. Two weeks later, we were forced to leave our homes and move into a ghetto. My mother, brother, and I were given a very small room. We had no clothes or blankets, so my mother and I went to the commandant, whom we knew very well, and asked him if he could go back to our home and collect our clothes. He allowed us to go and take what we wanted. We asked him about that, and he told us he was working in Heidegrug and is okay. Then on the 19th of Ju July, 1941, all men over 12 years old had to assemble in the schoolyard. My mother went back to the commandant and asked him if my younger brother could stay with her. All other men, including me, were marched to the stable of the Russian garrison. garrison. One SS man came up to us and asked, what trade we had. He collected 27 men, including me. He told us we were going to work in Germany. It was summer and very hot. We were in summer clothes and sandals. So we asked him if we can go home and get other clothes. He allowed us to go. I went back, changed my clothes and shoes and said goodbye to my mother and brother and said, maybe I'll see dad and work with him. The SS was waiting for us. While we were on the way, a friend told me that while I was gone, he saw my dad coming on a tractor from Heidekrug. I never saw my father again. He was apparently killed the same day with all nice Jewish men. I never believed that that could have happened. We were put in the barracks with other Jews from other small towns that were selected like us. We had to dig storm water canals through farms in the Heidekrug district. It was before Rosh Hashanah when a Lithuanian worker passed by our work, workplace and told us that all news, all Jews in Neustadt were killed. We were given very little food and everyone was hungry. The first month wasn't so bad as we had a as a guard who was going and didn't yeah. treat us badly. There was roll call twice a day, and one of us, whose name was Monas Kagan, who was a lieutenant in the Lithuanian army, he had to count and report the guard military style. But then things changed. Our guard had to go to the front and got and we got the wounded SS men who was very cruel. There were inspections of bed and clothes, and if the bed wasn't made army style, we were canned. One day my bed wasn't right. 
all of us had to assemble in the dining room where we were punished. My turn came, the assessment started to hit me with the leather type kind. He noticed something hard in my pocket. He opened the button of my pocket and took out my old book, which had a picture of me. But in, in it, I had two cut out pieces of the German front. When he saw that, he got red in his face, threw me onto the bench and started to hit me. You are a spy, he said. After a while, he stopped. For weeks, I couldn't sit or sleep on my bottom. When winter started, we were moved to Heidekrug, and we were working in different places. Some worked in brickyards that belonged to SS Turmbahnführer Dr. Scheu. We had an SA guard. There were father and two sons working in the brickyard. When the guard got drunk and made the father and sons crawl on their st stomachs in the water which the father and one son did, but the younger son tried to avoid the water. The SS man got mad, pulled out his revolver and shot the son dead. We had another tragedy after roll call. One of us whose name was Reuven, he was dumb, hid outside the camp and went to house to ask for bread. He was brought back straight away and the next day we had to assemble in the yard where he was hanged. A horse died on Dr. Scheuser's estate and was buried. It was winter and we asked for permission to dig it up again and cook it. They allowed it. It was the first time we had horse meat and it was very tasty, especially as we hadn't had any meat until then. A dairy was built in Heidekrug and I needed an electrician. The German contractor was an old man so he got us to do the work. He knew me as well as my dad. He told me he begged my dad not to go home, but my dad didn't listen to him. He told me that my dad begged Dr. Scheu to go home. It's Kumarinik and I were the electrician and installed all the lights and motors for the dairy and also wired a unit for the cheese maker. We worked a lot in the ceiling, putting cables and motors, pipes for lights. One day we stole a 10 kilogram round cheese, cut it in half and hid it in our toolboxes and took it into the ceiling where we ate it every day. There was a Belgian prisoner of war working with us who was a welder. He used to get parcels from the Red Cross. And one day he was caught with a half a liter of cream he was hanged the next day. We finished work in the dairy and went to work for farmers. After two years in Heidekrug in July 1943, we were marched to the railway station and herded into cattle trucks. There was only standing room and we were sent to Birkenau. The journey took about 10 days, no food, and only once we got water, but nobody got to drink the water. As everybody was so thirsty that everybody, everybody was fighting to get some, and most was spilled on the floor. I never got a drop. Most people started drinking their own urine. We arrived in Birkenau, the doors were opened and we had to run. There was a big closed van with red cross markings. There were SS men standing and letting only some people go to the van. The others, including me, had to stand on the side. And then we were marched to the, into the camp. Arbeit macht frei was written on the entrance. We saw the smoke from the ovens and smelled the sickening smell of burning flesh. We were all tattooed and my number is 132.703. It was hot in Birkenau and we were all thirsty. Whenever it rained, a lot of people were lying on the ground and drinking the water. I never did. But my be best friend, Itzke Mareinik, was one of them and they all got malaria. He came to say goodbye to me and went into the oven. 
there were more selections and another friend of mine who was a tailor and had wounds on his feet like me. So we always put green leaves on the wounds so that no dirt could go in. I took mine off and begged him to turn his leaves off also. I don't care anymore, he said to me. We won't get out of here. This s -man walked through all the rows and took out people. When he came to our row, he took one look at Phil and said, you with the green leaves come out. By that time, we were already skeletons. Our food was a half a litre of watery soup and in the evening, a slice of bread. Then came the enclosing. I lice checking. It was already cold at night time. We were standing outside in a row. We had to take off our clothes, which were thrown into a fluoride hole in the ground. A floodlight was directed, directed at the hole so the people that pulled the clothes could clouds out could see our numbers. It took hours until we got back our soaked clothes. We put on the wet clothes and went to sleep in them. By morning it was still wet. After that in October, we, I think for 1943, we were marched out of the camp. Those that couldn't walk and fell down the road were shot and left on the side of the road. We arrived in Warsaw and stayed in barracks, and our work was to clean the destroyed ghetto. I worked in an electrical commando. We were digging out and dismantling elect electrical transformers. We were then sent to Germany. There was a typhus epidemic in our camp, and one day I woke up in a type of hospital. I don't remember how long I was there, but it must have been a long time because when I came out, everybody was surprised to see me. They so thought I had died long ago. I went back to work on June 41. I was sent to Dachau. In Dachau, I met Easy Lichtenstein, who came from Lithuania. After a few days in Dachau without food, I was sent to Mildorf to work on a building site, carrying cement and iron bars. I was at the end of my strength already. One day on returning from work after the number count, I was, I was returning to, to my barrack when the Lagerführer second in command called me. Put this on, he said. It was an armband and written on it was Lagerreinigung. He said to me, tomorrow morning you stay in this place where we are now, and I will tell you where to go. He seemed very friendly. I asked him what I will have to do. He said, there are two others that are cleaning the camp. You just walk with them. You don't have to do anything. I will call you when there is work for you. Then he took me to the Lagerführer and said to him, how do you like this one? And showed him the armband. The Lagerführer was very friendly and said, I see you have marked your birds. Is he also a capo? I didn't hear the answer, but the second command got red in his face. I was very happy. I thought I'm on holiday. No more walking kilometers to and from work and no hard work. There were two Hungarian youngsters whose work was cleaning the road between the barracks, which took about 10 minutes. After that, we were free. They went to their barracks, barracks and I went to mine. But I couldn't go in. They said they were cleaning the barracks. In all the months, I was called to work three times so I had a time of my life not having to work. When the Lager Reining Camp Kling was called, I ran and the two Hungarians ran after me. That's when I had to work with them. Otherwise, I had nothing to do the whole day. I was on my own. The first time I was called to work when cement trucks arrived at night. The whole camp had to go to work, and again, that's when Lagerreinigung was called. 
and I went to the rest of the camp to unload the trucks by floodlight. The second time we were sent to the kitchen to peel potatoes, we sat on the wooden boxes and peeled potatoes, and one of the Hungarians was called Vidyorgo, started to nag me to ask the kitchen couple how long we had to, still to peel. He did, did not want to peel potatoes. After a while, I gave in and asked the couple if he still had a lot to peel. He didn't say a word, but hit me in the face. And a while later, he told us to go. The two Hungarians were quite young. Vidyogo never closed his mouth while we were walking. The other one never opened his mouth. One day, the German Lagerführer called us to mix cement. While we were mixing, he told us to throw this cement further. The two others did not throw further, and I did not throw either. I was the nearest to the German officer, and I got hit in the face. I tried to do what they di did by not throwing far to protect them. That's all I had to do in the months I was in Mildorf, and had to work only three times. I felt very good in Mildorf as there were no SS men and no soldiers in the camp. One day new people arrived. It was the men from Shavel. I met my cousin Hermann Ellert. He got to work at a clothing store, but only for a few days. While we were talking, Hermann told me, he is your brother-in-law. I met Jeskel. I was dumbstruck and could not open my mouth. He said, I married your sister, Lena. I asked him where she was, and he didn't know. She was sent to another camp. A few days later, all the men from Shavel were sent to another camp, the Waldlager. And then one day, we were marched out of the camp and put into cattle trucks again, and the train left from Mildorf and went to München. In München, the doors were opened, and Germans told us, that the war was over and they disappeared. After a while, the Americans arrived and we were sent to Feldafing. UNRWA looked after us and for the first time in four years, I had enough to eat. I was a skeleton at that time. I was talking to a friend in the street one day when an American soldier came up and gave us each a rifle with ammunition gave us a key and told us to look after the storeroom, which was full of clothes and shoes. We did it for a couple of months, when one day soldiers of the Jewish brigade arrived and asked us if we want to go to Israel. I just took my few belongings and jumped on, onto a truck of theirs. They took us through to Austria over the Alps, and from there we traveled in trucks until we came to a UNRWA camp in Santa Maria de Banya. We stayed on, in holiday villas that used to belong to Italians, but they didn't have any furniture and we slept on the floor. But we felt very good. We had enough food and swam in the sea to a nearby town that was called Santa Catarina to see films. I was all the time together with David Marchunsky. We often used to swim about two kilometers in the sea from Santa Maria to Santa Catarina. Then one day I got toothache and we were, there were no dentists in the little town. So I went to the next town, which was called Santa Croce, about 10 kilometers from where I was staying in Santa Maria. When I arrived there, not being able to speak Italian, I tried to explain that I had toothache. I was shown to a hospital, showed the doctor my tooth. He explained to me that he had no injections. I told him to pull as I couldn't stand the pain. He went outside and came back with two men. He put me on an operating table. One man held my head, the other one my feet, and the doctor pulled out my tooth. On the way back from Santa Croce, I ran all the way, so I did, it didn't take me long, as I was so sore. Then one day, new people arrived from Germany and 
told me that my sister Lena had arrived in Felderfinger. There were two others that wanted to go back to Germany as well as I, so we walked until we came to a railway station. The trains were always full. People were hanging from all sides in the, of the coaches. So we also jumped on and had a free ride to the Austrian border. At Brenna, a little town on the border of Italy, we got an Italian guide who took us up to the mountain. He gave us directions where we had to go. He also told us if the Austrians caught us, we had to say we were coming from Germany and wanted to go to Italy. And that is what we did. We started to walk, it was dark already. Most of the time we were sliding on our bottoms. After walking a whole night, apparently we were going in a circle. An Austrian ski patrol found us and took us to Innsbruck, where we were put onto a train back to Germany. I arrived in Felderfing, found Lena Jacheskel and the rest of the Elad family. Hermann, Moshe, Ida, Israel, David, and Judith, and Masha. For a while I was working at the UNRWA food magazine and then decided to get a job in a, at an electrical firm. I went to München by train every day and got work at Siemens Schuckert, an electrical firm and started to earn money. I also got food cards. I worked in München for nine months. One day I was told they need me in the camp at Feldefing. Then I became the camp engineer and worked for UNRWA. I had to look after I had to look after the electrical supply, plumbing, painting, roofs, the coal supply and all general repairs. I had to deal with a lot of German firms that had to do the work in the camp and had to sign all progress payments and contracts and was often at UNRWA headquarters in München. I got a present from a German firm, it was a Volkswagen motor car. I learned to drive in the camp and drove to München to get my driver's license and I passed. There was a lot of jealousy as I was the only one with the motor car. Here goes the boss of the camp I often heard when I passed. We stayed in Felderfing in a house in Villa Valberta, Jeskel and Lena in one room and I in another. That is where Mickey was born. One day Jeskel's mother, Sorelaya, Soromale, his sister Nessa and her husband Jankel arrived. I went to fetch them from the station in my motor car. In 1949, I decided to go to Israel, sold my motor car and bought a motorbike and was riding it in the camp. Then I had it crated and sent to Israel. I ha heard later that it was a stolen motorbike and apparently on the ship on the way to Israel there were about a hundred stolen bikes. So shortly after that I left for Israel by train and arrived in Venice where I stayed a couple of weeks and then left by ship for Israel. I arrived in Haifa and was put in a Marbara. I stayed there for a couple of days and took my case, jumped over the fence, got onto a bus and arrived in Tel Aviv. I stayed in Tel Aviv at Rechov HaChashmal with people from Felderfink in a room the way Herschel's friend. I got in touch with my cousin Miriam Gross and her husband Zigi, who took me to an electrical contractor, Asher Feuchtwanger, and I worked there till 1954. I was doing an overhead installation near Natanya, a youth aliyah camp, when I went to see a friend of mine who was together with me in the camp at Mildorf and afterwards in Santa Maria, Italy, David Marczynski. He introduced me to a cousin of his from South Africa, her name, Taubi Mann.